And our conversations with professors here at Columbia University continue on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. And now we're joined by Helen Benedict, who is the author of The Lonely Soldier. Professor Benedict, you start your book out with a quote by Martha Gellhorn. War happens to people one by one. Yes. What does that mean? I was struck by that quote because I was following the war home to the heart of every individual fighter, which is a phrase I'm quoting from D.H. Lawrence. And war does affect every single individual involved in it, whether they be soldiers or civilians. Um, it has, it's a monster that reaches deep inside every single person and uh, <clears throat> turns every life upside down. And I thought it was a very apt quote. How many women served in the Iraq War? About 200,000, actually over 200,000 have served in Iraq and Afghanistan Americans. together. Yeah, Americans with and the military. And is that unusual? Yes. The Iraq War in particular set a precedent historically. Um, <clears throat> more women have served and been wounded and killed in the Iraq War by around 2005, two years into the war already, than uh, all the American wars put together since World War II, including Afghanistan. So it was a huge, huge difference. One in every 10 troops in Iraq was a woman. Did they serve in different capacities than they have served in the past? Yes. Because of the nature of the war, which is basically a guerrilla war, the nature of all wars these days, there isn't any front line in our old-fashioned sense of you know, drawing a line in the sand or, drawing, or having an area where the soldiers from the enemy sides will meet up and fight. That just doesn't happen anymore. Wars, the, your battles take place in roads, in hospitals, when if, even if you're driving um, a truck full of toilet paper, you can be attacked. So because there's no front line, even if you're combat support or you're an engineer or a cook, you um, can get drawn into battle. And many, many women also were being used as gunners and working alongside with the infantry, doing exactly the same jobs as the infantry because of the shortage of troops. But women aren't supposed to serve in combat, are they? Right. This is the great irony. From the Pentagon's point of view, women are banned from ground combat, not air combat, but ground combat. On the ground, in reality, women have been fighting in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan for 10 years. Was there a typical experience for women in Iraq and Afghanistan for American soldiers? Um, it's hard to say typical because it really did vary depending on the year they were serving, where they were serving, and who they were serving with. Um, but the stories I did here were the most common story I heard were, were ones of isolation because, as I said, one in ten troops are women, but they don't necessarily get deployed together. So many women serve with a very small number of other women, are vastly outnumbered by men, sometimes even alone. I've talked to women who are the only ones serving with 60 men. The isolation of serving like that can lead to a lot of problems, um, from harass constant harassment and loneliness to sexual assault and rape. And I did hear a great deal more of those stories than I expected when I started my research. And that seems to be a common theme in The Lonely Soldier, harassment, sexual assault. It is. Who yeah. is Eli Painted Crow here on the cover? She was a sergeant, career sergeant, um, had been in the military 22 years by the time she was deployed to Iraq. And um, she was a sergeant first class and had been a drill sergeant as well. So she had also served in Honduras and at home. and she really had a long career behind her and had, was very enthusiastic about the army until she got sent to Iraq. Iraq was a whole different experience for her, partly because of the racism she experienced and partly because of the, the I would say, discrimination both racially and um, sexually that she experienced, but also because of the nature of the war itself, which she ended up turning against. Now, I'm not saying this is typical of every soldier, but that's another thing I heard from more soldiers than I expected, was, was a great deal of criticism about the war uh, based on what they were seeing on the ground, unlike what we hear about in our armchairs at home. Professor Benedict, how did you find 
the five women that you focus on in the book? I interviewed over 40 women who'd served in Iraq over about three years. I found through veterans groups mainly, and then one would lead me to another who, whom she'd served with, who'd lead me to others. And so partly it was a network, networking process. Partly it was people hearing that there was somebody out there writing about women in the military, and they wanted to be included. So a lot of the women came to me. They were felt invisible. They were risking their life and limbs just like men, but they weren't being recognized as real soldiers and taken seriously. A lot of them felt they were missing that. So they wanted their service to be recognized, and others wanted to whistleblow about the kinds of degradation they had experienced. So some came to me and some I found. And of those 40, I picked five in the hopes of, of finding a representation of, you know, of, of socio-economical range and also um, socio-economical range, geographical range, age, experience, attitudes, try to get a, a range so that it was a fair book. So the outliers in your research here would be those who continued to support the war and were not harassed? Well, the that, harass, I would say, 90, and some, the surveys show that some 99% of women are harassed while serving. So the outliers are the ones who are not harassed. When it comes to sexual assault and rape, it's somewhere between one in five and one in three. It's horrendous figures, and these are figures from surveys conducted by the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the military itself, by the way. Um, so, but, it, but they are still fewer than the ones who are not raped. So, um, but, and I give those statistics in the book, but the numbers are so horrific of epidemic proportions that I felt that it was really important to focus on this because other books weren't and hadn't. People were not aware of the degree to which we are persecuting our own soldiers. You're a professor of journalism. Is this a typical book for a journalism professor to write? <laughs> well, in our journalism school, we are working journalists, and we, a lot of us do in-depth investigative reporting. We also have the academics among us, but we are journalists. We're working journalists who teach. That's always been the profile of the school ever since Joseph Pulitzer founded it. Have policies changed because of the experience of women in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yes, they have. There have been many congressional hearings about the issues of harassment and assault. I've testified twice to Congress myself. They have changed some rules and policies and approaches. They've introduced more prevention training. Sexual assault counselors have been made available for women and men, because sexual assault is a huge problem for men as well in the military. Um, and there have been reforms, but we still have a long way to go. The, the rates of sexual assault do not seem to be dropping. Um, the prosecution rates within the military justice system are scandalously low, and there's a long way to go. Uh, Congress has been pressing the military to do, to do something about this for many years now, and the military has been extremely slow to respond in a, in a really productive way. There's a lot of denial been going on. Should women be allowed to serve in combat? Yes. We are, um, we are human beings. We have a right to have whatever jobs we want. Not all of us will choose that job. Not all of us would want to be in combat, but not all men want to be in combat either. It's very paternalistic um, to deny women a, a chance for the job just because of their gender. And indeed, there's a suit going on right now that the New York Times wrote about this very morning in, a, in its editorial. Uh, which on behalf of two women officers who are suing and say, are claiming that it's unconstitutional to, be, to bar women from combat because it denies them equal protection under the law. Now, Helen Benedict, you also wrote a novel called Sand Queen. <coughs> what is this book? It is, comes from the same research. I'm really writing a cycle of books about the Iraq War, nonfiction and fiction combined. It is the story of a woman soldier uh, in Iraq, at the very beginning of the war, she's guarding the, fer the first and biggest prisoner of war camp we set up over there called Camp Buka. And it goes back and forth between her story, her experience as a woman soldier, and the story of an Iraqi civilian woman. They meet at a checkpoint, 
and um, they begin to interact. This was based on things that my, my 